Hey, what's going on, guys? Lord Kao here, bringing you guys episode one, the introductory episode of Play This Game. This is going to be a series that's going to be ongoing that just kind of focuses on maybe underappreciated gems or just games that I've played over the course of my life that I think are just, you know, they should really deserve a bit more love. Um, and I really genuinely do think that they're worth your time. So for this episode, we'll be focusing on Gravity Rush, uh, which was originally released on the PS Vita and was remastered for the PS4. For this uh, entire review, we did use the PS4 version. It's just better and more accessible. Um, so overall, I would say that the game is pretty excellent. Uh, I'll be having some particular points uh, brought out in the video and stuff like that. If you like what you see, please like, comment, and subscribe. Just a quick reminder, uh, best way to get a hold of me is either going to be on Twitter or Discord. I'll leave links to those below. And uh, feel free to join me on Twitch every Sundays and Mondays. I'll be streaming different video games and stuff like that. So enjoy, guys. All right, guys, let's do some quick background regarding the game overall. Gravity Rush was originally released on May 2012 for the PS Vita and on February 16th for the PS4 Remastered Edition. For the purposes of this retrospective, we'll be looking at specifically the remastered version as sadly I haven't owned a PS Vita for years. Yeah, boys, go ahead and pour one out for Vita Gang. You know, we had good times, but it's over now. So let's get into why this game has held a special place for me after nearly a decade of first touching it. Okay guys, before we go any further, this video will contain major plot spoilers for Gravity Rush, so you have been warned. The world of Gravity Rush takes place in a town called Hexville? Hexville? Yeah, that place here. A fractured floating city in the sky which has been under attack by entities known as Nevi, seemingly other dimensional creatures that have been plaguing the city for some time with no explanation. The town of Hexville is comprised of four primary districts, Al Noir, Plejun, Industria, Venn Center, all distinctly different areas that Cat explores as the game progresses. Each section of town has its own distinct flow and feel, with the entertainment district of Plejun being my personal favorite. The stark contrast between the rose-tinted windows and college town scenery makes it ever-pleasing eye candy. As the story and town open up, you become nothing short of a hero and guardian of the town, winning the trust and adoration of the sometimes highly mercurial townsfolk. Overall, I would say that the world building in this game is quite strong and most non-playable characters story arcs are explored and have a general overall satisfying conclusion. Even this dickhead ice cream man, yeah you know the one I'm referring to. Let's start by taking a look at one of my favorite elements of the game, its visuals and art direction. The art director of this game, Yoshiaki Yamaguchi, drew influences on the environments and comic book style from Franco. Belgian Bendes Destiny comics. Yeah, I had no idea what those were either. Here's a few examples of them here now. If there's anything that publishers like Nintendo have shown us over the last few years is that your game doesn't need to push crazy pixels in order to still be considered beautiful and stand the test of time. Gravity Rush's art style is very reminiscent of a Skyward Sword X Breath of the Wild cell shaded look, which still holds up even better with the upgraded PS4 visuals. Damn good for a game that was pushing the better part of a decade. If it wasn't clear already, let me just say this clearly. I love and absolutely adore the art style of this game. Everything from the menus, characters, story panels are an absolute knockout. The cell shaded look of the towns and its inhabitants bring a very unique feel and vibe to each one of the separate areas of Hexville. Putting out the art style, the story is told through comic book-esque panels, which despite having a completely non-intelligible language, yes, I definitely tried to look this up. They must be speaking a foreign language, right? Probably Russian or Greek or something like that. It can't be that hard. Let me see. Gravity. Rush. Language. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was easy. I got it. We're expressive and illustrated enough to consistently convey the tone of which the story was flowing. Some people may dislike story panels as a way to tell a story, however, as somebody that had a copy of Marvel vs. Capcom 3 permanently affixed to my Xbox 360 for a number of years, I found myself pleasantly right at home. Okay, okay guys, I gotta come clean. I was fully ready to come in here and say that the music for this game was just acceptable at best. Hold on, hold on guys, don't throw your tomatoes at me just yet. Fool this man! No! Listening to the OST straight while writing and editing this video, I can't help but say I got this one 100% wrong. After hearing these songs from the course of my first two playthroughs of the game, I guess I had been away from them for just too long. 
After that quick refresher, I was reminded that this soundtrack is absolutely a blast with the following songs being what I consider to be the absolute S tier standouts. For my original playthrough, I can say that some of the themes arranged by Kohei Tanaka fit like a glove for this story and the world being presented. Alright guys, let's talk about the story. Hmm, how can I put this? The story is definitely one of the more abstract elements when it comes to the entire overall Gravity Rush package. While it starts off fairly straightforward and naturally opens up and complicates as the story expands, it seems to be unable to keep a cohesive narrative throughout the latter portions of the story, up to and including the game's final climax, which while I found to be visually stunning, fell a bit flat overall. As the story progresses, you have an opportunity to restore pieces of the town by way of trials by this guy in a trench coat. No, 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 not that guy. This guy, Gade, who is a creator. Godlike beings who help Cat restore the world around her. I would say for the first 50 to 70% of the game, I was 100% on board and willing to jump into this guy's trench coat repeatedly at a moment's notice to see what other portions of the town could be restored and dive into the history and lore of Hexville and fill in the pieces to the puzzle that is Cat's backstory. The protagonist Cat is an amnesiac gravity shifter who by way of her cat Dusty can manipulate gravity at her whims and comes to discover that her role in the ongoing plot is much bigger than was initially hinted at. I find that overall Cat is an exceptionally cool protagonist, albeit with the slightly overused amnesia trope, her interactions and rapport with the citizens and other non-playable characters in the game kept the game light and fresh for its roughly 30 hour playtime that's not including any in-game content. In conclusion for the overall story, this ultimately gave me a feeling of a bit of a hollow victory by the time the credits roll, as you really haven't had most of your questions answered regarding Cat or the Nevi or even the creators answered. While I can appreciate the developer's intent to leave some intrigue and ambiguity for potential sequels, it is a bit frustrating to have intriguing characters and motivations laid out as the story progressed with no satisfying conclusion or payoff. My thinking is that this game was always intended to be part of a two-part structure from its inception, being kind of a Kill Bill scenario, Kill Bill 1, Kill Bill 2, which completes the overall arc. Cat's main ability by way of Dusty is the ability to shift gravity, which is the foundation of all her abilities that she unlocks as the story progresses. Now, I remember playing this game on the Vita and thinking, man, I'm just complete ass at the navigation and control of Cat. I just couldn't get it. There's something that just didn't click for me. Then playing the games five years later, I chalked it up to this kind of having old man hands. You know, I was like, ah, oh, man, you know, I just can't get it. At this point, I potentially came to the conclusion that I probably just fundamentally misunderstood how she was to be piloted. However, after watching numerous Let's Plays and tutorials on the game, it's safe to say that I was hardly alone in this. This was a clear design decision made by the team over at Bluepoint Games, and the more I thought on it, the more it made sense. Flying through the air by suspension of gravity isn't exactly a precise science any way it's sliced, so my inclination was that they wanted to emulate and convey the feeling uh, throughout the gameplay, and in my opinion, the more I thought on it, they absolutely nailed it. The main opponent that you'll be facing are Nevi, other dimensional creatures that appear when it's pretty much convenient to the plot and gives Cat something to beat up. While most Nevi can be fodder level, some of the end game Nevi are particularly annoying to fight and take precise positioning and a concrete game plan to take down consistently. Or, you know, you can just use Micro Black Hole over and over again until they're dead. Now, let's talk about boss battles. 
This is probably one of the only elements in the battle engine that seem to be a consistent letdown to be honest. It generally boiled down to either chasing down the opponent repeatedly or waiting to perform one of your special attacks to greatly injure them and waiting for it to recharge, rinse and repeat until they're dead. This is probably the only noticeable flaw in an otherwise fluid and engaging combat scheme. The X Factor. So with all of those basic ideas explored and broken down, let's circle back down to why I think this game is 100% worth your time. I would say overall the thing that keeps me coming back to this game in particular is the open world and your ability to traverse it. For a game that was released back in 2012, on a handheld no less, your ability to traverse a city by way of gravity manipulation continued to give me your euphoric feelings from the beginning of the game right until the credit roll. This one time with the insanely great musical selection and overall design and art aesthetic makes this a consistently enjoyable experience throughout. Not to mention the superb end game and side quest content that actively encourages you to explore and experiment by way of trials that reward you with precious gems to help augment your overall gravity stats. So if I had to boil this down and distill it into one main reason that you should play this game, I would say that it comes back down to the game's main mechanic, gravity shifting. It's so well executed that I would actually play this game as an open world game with no enemies at all and still feel completely content. And there we go, guys. Episode one of Play This Game. Hit me on Twitter and let me know what game you think we should do next.